James Garrett is a brain coach and founder of Brain by Design. He has spoken on stages ranging from Harvard to TEDx, and his work has been featured in the New York Times, Fast Company, and Harvard Business Review. He spent years doing research with some of the best psychologists in the world at Columbia, Tufts, and Yale. That's amazing. Uh, he's, I can't believe James has decided to come to our group. This is incredible. Uh, he's a content creator and course builder, and his course called Brain Science for Coaches has been rated as one of the best courses for coaches and is currently certified by ICF for 30, 30 continuing coach education credits. He is a certified coach through the Whole Fit Coaching Program. He also built one of the only brain-based positive psychology curricula in the Middle East and trained thousands of Arab youth in partnership with Queen, Queen Rania of Jordan, a rare combination of scientist, trainer, and entrepreneur. In 2019, James launched the Deep Change Project, a personal journey to discover what's possible at the outer edges of neuroplasticity and to overcome fear. Holy cow, I can't wait to find out what Let's Get Fun Comfortable is all about. James Garrett, please, please come off mute and share us, share yourself with us. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That's so very kind. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all. Thanks so much for spending the time. Minx, I can't believe you're taking time away from your dinner party. That just like warms my heart. Um, I signed your program already. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. And um, and good news for you, but I hope for everyone else, this the particular um, uh, thing we're doing tonight, the, the topic tonight is is not in the course. So this is sort of, I guess, bonus material or something. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about discomfort, which sounds like a terrible topic to talk about, except that um, we're going to be talking specifically about how it's related to growth and why discomfort is often an indicator or a clue that we're in like a growth zone or a growth um, path. And so this really matters because there are lots of emotions that come up for us or for our clients uh, when it comes to stretching ourselves, to to growing, to to sort of pushing uh, what we're you know where we've been. And, and, and sort of extending ourselves into new domains and new learnings and new areas of growth, because often we resist that, we procrastinate stuff, and all of that is born of this uh, emotional life that we're all living. Um, so, so today we're going to be talking about how do you get better at discomfort? If comfort is a clue that you're in a good, a good place or in a good zone, a growth zone, um, how do you get better at holding space for the difficult emotions that come up, you know, when we're growing? Um, and how do you get more skilled at embracing discomfort, getting out of our comfort zones as a way of living, as a way of being, rather than just this sort of random occasional thing that we do every once in a while? All right, here we go. Um, now, I know that you would never, never see this in Florida, but uh, we're going to start with this picture. <laughs> Those are my feet. And um, this was about a week and a half ago. <laughs> I know, Jimmy was telling me it's like 89 down there today. I was like, oh, geez, we're, we're on the same planet. We're in New Hampshire, so it's like, you know, we're up here. Anyway, I, I, I want you to imagine and kind of try to vi like feel the emotions. If this were your feet and you were looking at that nice hole carved out of the ice, what emotions would be going on inside of you? Feel free to just put those in the chat. You know, what, what would come up for you? And again, the idea here is, yes, we're going for a swim, just in case that wasn't clear. What uh, what emotions come up? Let's see here. Exerting. <laughs> let's go, let's go. Susan, fear I would fall through. Yeah, I had that. Tony, horror. Alexandria, courage. Oh, good. This is a good group. This is a brave group. Anybody else is good. Burr, Virginia. 
Okay. Um, many of us, myself included, feel a sense of anticipatory dread when looking at situations like this. Kind of like, what the heck am I doing? This is the most insane thing. What are we, why? Why am I doing this? I'm doing this by choice. What am I crazy or something? Like there is a there is a flood of very strong and very vocal both emotions and thoughts that come up in us when we have when we're faced with um challenging situations. Um I am here by choice. Uh, which does matter, but uh this is the uh the part 2 of this little engagement. Uh and uh, yeah, it's as cold as it looks. It's about thirty-three degrees. I had a thermometer, um, so we we're you know we're pushing like you know one degree above freezing, and um, um, still exhilarating. Yeah, good question. <laughs> good question, Jimmy. Um, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that because uh, this was not just um, a single day in February. I did this every day of February and I've come to love it so much that I still do it <laughs> on a daily basis, which sounds insane because I am not a cold water person. My family is like, oh yeah, he's always the last one in, you know, um, I'm that guy. So, so this is not like my favorite pastime. This is like the thing I like the least and yet somehow I've grown to love it. So that's also part of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but but the main thing on this that I want to want to discuss is how do we go from after my brain is predicting this is going to be awful, right? But after you do it, you feel like, like every time, every time. It's incredible. Your body is literally flooded with this endorphin rush that you can't explain unless you it is amazing how good you feel. Now, it's a little cold, <laughs> but the joy and the rush is out of control. It's amazing. It's absolutely um well, it's just much more than you expect. All right, so I want you to take based on the faces. I'm not sure you've convinced anyone of that yet, James. So keep working. <laughs> it's okay. You know, I don't want to, no, no convincing needed. I think you just need to look at my face in the picture. Um, that's pure elation. <laughs> um, 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 and, and it does feel better after more than during, just to be clear. But what's so fascinating about this, what, what we're talking about here is the brain predicts awful. This is going to be the worst thing ever. And then you do the hard thing. And on the other side of doing the hard thing, you feel elated. Confidence surges, uh, a feeling of, oh my gosh, any, I, can, I can tackle other challenges, right? The, the sense of um, having overcome something difficult, uh, this feeling of, 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 um, uh, of strength, actually. Uh, often accompanies this. This one's a pretty physical challenge, right? So that, but that's very much part of that experience overcoming this, the, the, so you have this sort of physical sense of strength. Um, but, but mostly it's, uh, it, it, it's like joy. So brain predicts dread and then you experience joy. All right. So what's that about? Er, scientists call this a prediction error. <laughs> this is a very bland scientific word for something that's totally wild because your brain predicts it's going to be totally awful. And then it has this experience of total awesomeness. All right. This happens again and again. If I hadn't done this for the last 35 days or so, I wouldn't have believed this. Uh, but, but I actually viscerally know how true this is at born of my experience. All right. Which brings us to my next point. And I wish this weren't true. I really do. But everything we want in life, a meaningful, good life, lies on the other discomfort. The things we care about the most, right? Whether it's good health, learning new skills, creating good habits. You know, when we were younger, we would 
this would have been academic success, putting in those hours of studying for the grade uh, and et cetera. Work success, learning new skills, taking on new challenges, new roles and responsibilities and stretching ourselves to, to become better in those jobs we do. Um, leadership, which is really just a succession of, di succession of difficult conversations. Uh, good relationships. John Gottman and others have shown that it's really the how we handle the the, the conflicts actually that predicts the, the longevity of relationships. So the better or more skilled we get at discomfort, i.e. holding space for discomfort to work through the hard conversations, the more likely we are to have stable, not to say they're not, don't ever have conflict, but that we have stable, connected, and um strong relationships. Uh, and again, confidence, which is what I brought up with the ice plunges. Um, one of the one of the surest forms of confidence is overcoming challenge uh, over and over and over and over again in our lives. And so to embrace discomfort is to lead to the emotion or experience of confidence. Why does this happen? Why does challenge or difficulty or discomfort make us stronger? Such a such a weird concept, right? There's this funny um, term in science, the, the scientists who study this, Edward Calabresi is one of them, uh, called hormesis. It's the Greek word, but it's sort of this funny word. Uh, and what it means is, I'll just read the definition, the adaptive responses of biological systems, which is of course includes us, to moderate environmental or self-imposed challenges through which the system improves its functionality and or tolerance to more severe challenges. All right, that's a lot of scientific jargon or a little technical. <laughs> Basically means when we experience micro doses of challenge, of discomfort, of even stress, that we become stronger as a result of those things. All biological systems, this is the case. There's a repair, a recovery, and a strengthening process, right? Think of going to the gym or something, right? You you, you do those, you know, the, the the you inflict some sort of pain, even damage, you might say, to to the muscles involved, and then they grow back stronger uh, because they expect that that behavior of lifting weights is going to happen again, and they want to be ready for it, right? So this is a product of all biological systems. Uh, and what I want to sort of put out there is it's not just true for the physical systems, but it's true for the emotional systems and the nervous systems. All right. Uh, just a quick, very quick overview of hormesis, how it plays out. Um, I've been playing around with extreme temperatures, uh, uh, but there's other examples of this. That we know boost, boost the immune system, right? These are all the, some of the some of the physical and health and, and other kinds of benefits. Caloric restriction, which I hate because I really don't like fasting, uh, extends lifespan. Dang it! <laughs> Exercise improves mood, builds muscle, and activates neurogenesis, which is the birth and growth of new neurons. Mental struggle while learning leads to better memory. So if it feels hard or effort filled, you're more likely to remember it better. If it's easy, it'll just go right through you. <laughs> your brain won't stick. It won't stick in your brain, basically. Uh, fears, um, which is a process of emotional habituation, which we'll talk a lot about today, uh, reduces their impact. So one of the only ways to, to diminish the fear or anxiety we have is to actually gently and kindly, but actually embrace or walk through the fear, do the very thing we're afraid of, uh, again, ideally in a supported way, which is partly as coaches, uh, the role that we serve. All right. I want to talk about a study real quick. So this is a great study done by Nicholas Epley and colleagues at the University of Chicago. And um, Nicholas Epley was really curious about this phenomenon he would see in pub on public transportation. He'd see all these people, you know, on the bus, and, and all of them are looking like this, you know, down at their iPads, down at their phones, and uh, none of them talking to each other. Look familiar, right? <laughs> um, 
this is like all too true, not even just in public transportation, but unfortunately like restaurants and things too, but, but let's just stick to public transportation for now. And <clears throat> Nicholas Epley knows that one of the deepest forms of joy and uh, happiness is actually social interaction. So here he is looking around and he's going, okay, so there's this opportunity for everyone to increase their joy simply by engaging with the person next to them, but nobody's doing it. Why aren't they doing it? Which is a great question for a scientist to ask. The answer would seem obvious. Well, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be a you know, I don't want to bug them. Maybe they've got a deadline at work. They're working on something. Like We just keep to ourselves. It's really because of the emotion of awkwardness, right? It's like, it's going to be awkward. Yeah, Jimmy, please. I have a question. Um, isn't there sort of an unwritten social contract, though, that when we're on our commute, we basically keep to ourselves and not get into the other person's business? In America, there is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've lived in lots of different cultures and in other countries, that is certainly not the case. Um, there is a, a strong norm of privacy, um, but it's just a norm. It's a social norm. It's not, it's not anything other than something we we all sort of implicitly agree to do mostly because we see other people doing it, but there is definitely no reason, no strong, um, uh, no binding reason, you know, for, for why we do this um, other than uh it seems, quote, normal, right? Um, so here's what they do. Nicholas Epley's like, okay, this curious. He's, he's curious scientist. He goes, well, why don't we just bring people in the lab and we'll, and we'll get them on buses and we're going to have them talk to strangers just to see how this goes. And, you know, his graduate students and stuff are like, oh, all right. It's going to be kind of a hard study to conduct, but I think we can do it. So, so bring people in the lab. They explain the whole situation. But first, before they, so they prep them all with all the information and they, but before they have them get on the buses, they say, okay, we got to ask you a handful of questions. What do you expect this experience to be like for you? And the flood of data they get from all these people who have not gone on the buses, again, think back to me before I jumped in the ice, dread, anticipation, anxiety, sweaty palms, heart racing, this is going to be awful kind of a feeling. They give the exact same experience, like, like, you know, information. Oh, uh, I'm going to feel awkward. This is going to be weird. Um, I'm going to, they're, you know, I'm probably going to experience some social rejection. They're going to maybe get mad at me. Uh, not, I'm not really excited about this. Hmm. And they're like, great. They grab all the data. The emotions are pretty negative before they go on. And then they get on the bus with two researchers. So once one of the researchers sits relatively close to the interaction, and one sits kind of toward the back. And the 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 participant chats it up with the stranger. Hey, where are you headed? You know? Oh, uh, uh, and usually it's like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, well uh, downtown. I'm I'm going to work. Uh, where are you where are you headed? Uh, oh yeah, I'm also going downtown. What stop do you get off on? And suddenly they're in this conversation. Again, it's always a little bit like it, 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 at the beginning, but eventually it starts getting fluid. And before they know it, they're starting to talk about things that they have in common. They're starting to talk about they live in the same neighborhood. Oh my gosh, that's so weird. I didn't know that. Where do you live? And like all of a sudden, what was this kind of like, you know, slightly awkward conversation turns into this joy-filled, oh my gosh, I'm meeting this fun, interesting, new possible friend in my life. <laughs> All right. So the, the participant in the studies start that, you know, it's obviously one at a time, but they get off the bus and one of the researchers gets off with them to gather the data. And they say, how do you feel? How was the experience for you? <laughs> and uh, their report back, Oh my gosh, that was so good. Like, it was so fun. I had no idea. Like, we, our kids, I didn't even know this, but our kids, go, you know, mine was a little older, but they went to the same preschool. And like, I mean, all of a sudden they have a new friend. Everything about the interaction was not just better, but like way better than they anticipated. Right? So brain predicts awkwardness, has the experience of connection and joy. Then the other researcher goes and sits next to the stranger and says, 
hi, my name's, you know, Mark something, something. It says, we're, we're with the Chicago, um, University of Chicago psychology department. Um, you, the person who sat next to you was part of our study. Um, and, uh, I'm one of the researchers. Uh, is you mind if I ask you just a few questions about that experience? Oh yeah, sure. What was that experience like for you? Same thing. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad. Like it was so funny. We're actually it was so weird. I I didn't know why they were talking to me, but all of a sudden we had so much in common. We're actually going to lunch next week. Is that so weird? Like all of a sudden it's like both parties are having the time of their lives. Again, brain predicts awkwardness awfulness, you know, whatever it is, and then going through those difficult emotions and actually doing the thing you're afraid of on the other side has all these positive emotions. All right. So what's going on here? This is really weird. Turns out most of us think happiness lives in this nice little circle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> happiness, right? is something like at least, and often it's depicted this way, whether it's in the media or wherever else, but it's like depicted as ease, right? Life on a beach, nice vacation. Isn't that often what marketing looks like when it comes to like the, 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 the good life? It's like ease, right? Things are easy. Comfort, you know? Temperature controlled rooms. Now, not that you need it in Florida, but in our... In our our corner of the world, uh, whatever it is. But the point is comfort is, is, is really like the, the, what the, the kind of, what we're kind of ultimately told is, is sort of the good life, um, in many different flavors of it. Um, it is a life, um, but, but it's maybe not the best life. Um, and, and, and contrary to what, many of us believe about the way emotional life works. Um, most of us don't want to get out of the comfort zone because it is by definition uncomfortable. But what happens right outside the comfort zone is like, we don't fall off a cliff. We don't die. We just go into this great new space, which is where growth happens. So that experience of those two people on the bus chatting it up, suddenly they just have a new friend, right? Growth in a social context is, is, a, is, a, is a new relationship. So a new connection, a deepening of, 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 of social support in my, in my, uh, in my friendships or, or relationships. And what's so weird about discomfort and growth <laughs> is that you have to get uncomfortable to grow. <laughs> and again, I, I really wish this weren't true. I really wish this weren't true because I, I really wish I could grow in my comfort zone. I, I like, I, I, it's nice. It's like a down comforter, man. I just like, I want to stay in there. I just want to like put the covers over and just like curl up on a you know cold winter day. Sorry, I keep talking about the weather guys. I don't mean to. It's just because it's actually still winter here. <laughs> but, but, but growth happens by definition outside of that place where we feel most comfortable. Now, a lot of people can take this too far. Um, and when we do, it, it, it creates a panicky feeling. Now, panic is not the goal. And, and I, I see this a lot when I talk about discomfort. Sometimes people um, can, uh, and people do this sometimes with kids, you know, their own kids where they, they, think they're doing them good by pushing them outside their comfort zone, but maybe they go too far too quickly or, or the kid doesn't have some measure of control or choice in the situation, which really does matter in terms of keeping it in the growth zone. Um, I actually overdid these cold plunges that I did the first three days I overdid it. And I had like a panic kind of response so uh, the way, the reason I know this is because I jumped all the way into my neck, like out of the gate. Um, and I was doing this, by the way, it wasn't just at the lake. I also did it. I, I mostly did it in a, in a ice tub in my backyard, in my, on my deck. <laughs> that was where I was doing it. But the first three days, um, like I just jumped right in and it really did create this panic response. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, 
what am I doing? <laughs> this is the worst thing ever. Um, it took me a little bit of time to realize if I just go slowly and stay in control and don't allow myself to think I need to do it at any certain rate, right? That I'm in the driver's seat of the process. I would get into the water right about to here, just below my chest. I would let the stress response like come up and then cool down. And then I would slowly get up to my neck. And when I would do it that way, I felt completely in control. And I went from the comfort zone to the growth zone and never actually entered the panic zone. This was one of my big learnings uh, over the last you know month or so. So again, I want you to think about the growth zone, this middle zone as the Goldilocks zone. It's not too cold. It's not too hot. The pressure, the intensity of the emotion. It's just right. So this is Lev Vygotsky's zone of proximal development that you're looking at. Very famous social psychologist. Um, and what he his one of his core insights is that all human growth and flourishing happen in this middle place um, where it's like a strike zone. It's like the sweet spot of human development. So I want you to think about growth as like a, you know, you could think of it like amusement park. Like I want, I want to, I want to play in that, you know, in that space, it's kind of a fun space to be, but there's a ticket involved. There's a price and you have to pay something to be in that world. And it's discomfort. Discomfort is the price of growth. So again, this matters with clients because it matters that we set them up for the proper expectation of what this engagement will look like with us over time, right? Um, if we, if we, and often this is unintentional, but if we set them up to assume or expect that this is going to be, you know, Skittles and unicorns, um, there might, there may not be in the right mindset or f framework to to really, you know dig in and really be ready for the growth that they're that they're you know asking us to be a facilitator and a, a partner with them uh, on um another another way and i think important distinction here besides that just that discomfort is um the price of growth is that there are some kinds of discomfort that are uh not productive or not or or just they're just unnecessary suffering so, so not all discomfort is good. Just want me to make make sure that's clear. Um, uh, gratuitous suffering is not. Uh, this is not what we're talking about. It's, you know, suffering for suffering's sake is not what anyone uh, would 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 describe as a good thing. Uh, the kind of discomfort we're talking about is usually this. It's discomfort that's ideally not always, but ideally it's chosen by you. So you're opting in to that challenge that opportunity for growth. And, and it is in the service of something bigger than the discomfort itself. It's not about the discomfort, <laughs> right? It's in the service of a relationship you're trying to mend or strengthen. It's in the service of taking on that new job title or responsibility, which is going to build your skill set and your capacity in your work life. It's whatever it is. It's it's making cold calls, um, you know, to potential new clients or new businesses, you know, as a coach or consultant. Um, by the way, that is my second challenge for March. Every day I'm making cold sales calls, which I hate doing. <laughs> right? So I'm from cold plunges to cold calls, um, and we'll get into why why in just a bit. But I want you to think the the main takeaway here is the emotional discomfort. So so we for us. Um, but what we sometimes forget is there is an emotional gym too. And the emotional gym often looks like this. It's like a discomfort gym. So when I want, so at the end of the day, as you're kind of reflecting and maybe you have a gratitude journal or something, why don't you just ask yourself the question, did, you know, did I get my daily dose of discomfort? Did I do something hard? Did I lean into those opportunities that were awkward or hard, those hard conversations? Or did I avoid them? It's often interpersonal. It's often our closest relationships where these things come, come about, you know, especially in the social or relationship realm. Um, but did I do, did I, when 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 presented with a, with an opportunity to choose the difficult path, did I did I lean into it? 
and see the discomfort as an invitation, like, oh, I'm in the sweet spot here, not as, oh, this is going to be awful. We'll get back into that that tension in just a sec. All right. He, here's why this, this cold plunges and cold calls, among other things I'll probably be doing this year, uh, matters so much is what I'm really asking is how do we get better at this skill? Not because I, James, am some pro at this, quite the opposite. I know the things that I'm like, you know, that I, that I shy away from, that I avoid. And it's really those very things that I'm most interested in training or retraining my nervous system to master, to get better at, to improve, to chill out, to soothe, right? To, to feel a sense of competence or confidence around those things, as opposed to anxiety. And this is, uh, you know, out of, I'm out of my depth. So again, this is an example, the, the, the bus uh, thing we talked about, but how would, if you wanted to get better at initiating conversation, even if you just wanted to play around with starting to build more friends, or maybe you're working with a client who they could use uh, a little more social support in their lives, right? How would one go about actually practicing this skill? How do we get better at discomfort? Well, for most emotionally intense experiences that provoke, provoke anxiety or, or dread or, 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 you know, aversive emotions, the, the life cycle looks like this. You've got on the vertical axis, the intensity of the emotion, and then on the horizontal axis, the, how much time it takes for that emotion to peak and then come all the way back down to normal. Now, <laughs> at the beginning of my polar plunges, this was me. <laughs> You ask my wife, she'll tell you. She'll be like, yeah, he was a mess before I jumped in every morning <laughs> because it was really painful, you know? And, and most days it was like, th the water was actually around 33 degrees, even in my backyard. Um, I've never been in water that cold, you know? And my body naturally is like, oh, shoot, this is really a bad idea. So it's going to create all this emotion right? And then the natural response to emotions that are that avoidant and anxiety inducing is procrastination. So what I would do is I would just procrastinate and I'd find other things to do that looked productive, but really were just avoiding the thing I had, you know, intended to do. But after week one, my anxiety looked a little more like this. And then after week two, my anxiety looked a little more like this. And after week three, just a little bit better. And after week four, I was like, yeah, I feel something. It's not nothing, but it's orders of magnitude. More normal, more in control, more a feeling of, I got this, rather than, oh no, what's this, right? This is called emotional habituation, emotion habituation. So what we're doing is we're essentially extinguishing fear, not completely, but we're decreasing the intensity of fear, anxiety, overwhelm, stress, with the exact same activity through a process of repetition over time. Now, granted, I was doing a lot of homework in the background. I was reading, I read a book called Winter Swimming. I read Wim Hof's book. I was doing some Wim Hof breathing stuff. I'm like digging, man, because I got to find answers because it's right up in my face every day. I got to figure this out. I'm thinking about the vagus nerve and how fast I'm going. That's all that stuff I told you. I, there's a little bit of neuroscience in there for, for why I was going in the way I was going in. I, I'm learning all sorts of stuff because I'm being forced to because it's right in front of my face. Now, I chose that, right? Nobody's forcing me to do that. I'm opting into that the whole time. However, the learning on it's just like insane because it, it goes so fast because it's like I have to, it's like I'm putting myself by choice in that l rapid learning environment. But what that's doing is making it so that I must almost get those emotions under control or they'll start controlling me. Yeah. 
Now, again, the polar plunge is a little bit of an extreme example, but again, the cold calls is a little bit more sane, you know, the cold calling, um, a little more, more kind of what we'd expect in a, in a, in our business life at least. And, um, sure enough, I'm finding the exact same thing. Like with cold calling, which I absolutely hate, uh, it started out beginning of last week right there. And now I'm about right here. <laughs> Which is like, I still don't like it, but it's noticeable, the change, this emotion habituation, the, the lessening, the tolerance that you start building. All right. Scientists have a special word. It's called distress tolerance. Distress tolerance. I do not recommend reading this book because it is a brick of an academic read, but the, that's the actual book, Distress Tolerance. Um, um, it'll make your mind melt with the statistics and the like overly technical analysis. But there's a very qu quite researched um, uh, foundation to what we're talking about, which is what, 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 what the scientists are saying is they think there's sort of a root cause to many of what looks like symptoms, right? especially in the clinical realm. And one of the core causes they're starting to believe is this, it's distress tolerance. How skilled is a person at managing or coping with difficult emotion? The better we get at this, the more capacity and resilience we have in the face of hard things, as opposed to running away, avoiding, numbing, or a thousand other behaviors that we do, again, whether that's technological or with food or with, you know, uh, substance abuse or whatever it is, like, like when emotions get strong and we don't feel like we have the capacity to manage those strong feelings, right? We, we turn to things that basically they're, they're escape-like behaviors, right? And distress tolerance, this building of this emotional skill that we're talking about is one of the core ways in which we can regain control of our lives, rebuild our stress capacity to manage that stress, and ultimately, in the service of that growth, actually start going down paths that are growth-oriented. Right. This is one of the ways I think people can ultimately get unstuck in their lives, is to realize there's an emotional skill set here which is about holding space for the difficult emotions and actually working through them rather than just you know, avoiding them. Which again, by the way, used to be this guy. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. All right. Um, one of the things that I think really matters here is that there's a real contradiction in the brain between your brain doing what it does naturally and doing what a brain does when it's highly trained. So your brain's default setting is like, oh, hard conversation with my significant other. Um, yeah, we're just going to pretend like nothing happened and try to put on a happy face and, uh, and, and talk all smiley. This is my defense mechanism, by the way. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and kind of just like, you know, brush it under the rug and, and kind of just be happy, man. Right. Like that, that's like my, that my dad taught me that. You know, my wife's like not having it. And, and like, by the end of the night, she's like, so are you ready to talk? And I'm like, oh, shoot, it didn't work. <laughs> right. So I'm like avoiding, avoiding, avoiding. And then eventually like, cause my wife's more skilled at this of, of holding space for conflict than I am. She'll, she'll, she'll nicely bring it back up. And I'm like, gosh, you're good. Right. But, but, but the real question is how do we change from avoiding discomfort to embracing discomfort? There's this really, really lovely paper um, by Caitlin Woolley and, and Eileen, er, sorry, I let Fishbach. Um, it's this right here. It's called Motivating Personal Growth by Seeking Discomfort. Motivating Personal Growth by Seeking Discomfort. What they're really arguing is that if you see discomfort as an indication that I'm on a growth path or in a growth space, it will motivate you to be persistent and, and hold on through the hard emotions until you actually have some wins. Yeah, I don't know if, it, you know, in your, in your relationships, if it works like mine, but I know my wife is usually right. 
And, and, and when she says, we need to talk, I usually know what that means. And, and I know that if I, or I should say I've learned, I've learned that when I hold space for it, and if it's feedback for me for something I'm messing up on, that's part of it, right? Whatever it is, or maybe she just, something's going on for her, you know, and she needs some support or whatever it is. But the point is I hold space for it. And then we hold space for each other and we work through the hard part of the conversation. And eventually, naturally in a relationship, when, when understanding is had and empathy is felt by both parties, we, we experience reconnection. We experience a coming back together, right? And relationships are always like this. The strongest, healthiest relationships are always like this. So instead of seeing the discomfort as like, oh, there's a problem here. Seeing the discomfort as, oh, maybe my wife has some feedback for me of ways that I can be better as a human. Growth opportunity. Okay, wow, different game. We're playing a different game. This is a different game. All right, we'll get more into this in just a bit. Um, but what the main gist I want to take away is it's not just discomfort. It's what we've been talking about so far, okay? So it's getting uncomfortable, but then there's this whole because your brain naturally wants to push discomfort away, there is a skillful application of leaning into that emotion that if you can learn, you can get better and better and better at embracing discomfort. The primary ingredient that your brain wants is fun, is positive emotion. It doesn't just want the discomfort. It wants to know like there's some point to it, right? It wants to know like, okay, so there's going to be something good at the end, right? Right? We, we get some cake at the end of this broccoli. Am I right? You know, it's that kind of thing. And the reason why is because brains are tricky. And again, we'll get into this, why this, this application matters so much. And I'm using fun in the broadest sense. Basically, I'm including all positive emotion in here. Joy, connection, relationships, anything that elicits posit positivity or positive emotion. And so again, you put these two words together, you just want to make those, you want the, a skillful application of embracing discomfort looks a little bit more like a blending of discomfort and positive emotion or fun together. Okay, we'll talk about why this matters in just a sec, but I have to give you a quick example for my two kids and they're now three and nine. <laughs> Young kids are the best. There's so much work, but they're so fun. <laughs> All right. As any parent, I'm trying to get more greens into my kids. Get those greens in the kids. I know I got vitamin K amongst a whole host of other goodness, you know, for their cells. I'm like, they need their greens, right? I sound, I sound like... Sounds I'm, I'm, I'm like so boring, right? Parents are so predictable, right? Um, but the point is, I drink this every morning. That's called athletic greens. It's just a green powder, you know. It's like no big deal. But but um, my kids also get a very small little bit of my green drink and placed in front of them with their breakfast. That's just what they get, not for breakfast, but like as part of breakfast. <laughs> Um, and generally speaking, they both look at it and they just push it away. And I'm like, and it's gone on for months, by the way. And I'm like, oh, what am I doing wrong? What, how can I fix this? How can I change this? How can I, what can I do? How, what, what can we do? What, what, like, what, I'm always thinking iteratively. How can we, how can we make this work? Uh, and one, and I was like, oh. I had this idea and I walked up to them and I was like, I'm Sophie and Eon. I said, so, Ian, have you guys ever played the biggest green mustache game? And they were like, what? And I was like, no, guys, this is like the best game ever. I played it all. I mean, it's so good. It's so good. They're like, what, what do you mean, Dad? You, and my nine-year-old saying this. How do you play? And I'm like, wait, wait let, me just, let me just show you. So I grabbed the huge jug and I'm like, and just getting the biggest, juiciest green mustache I can. And I say, beat that. My nine-year-old's my nine -year -old's like, it's on. So, of course, she goes first. And 
she's like the artist. So she got like a Salvador Dali curl. You notice that? That's like, she's good. She's good. Yeah, it wasn't just like a lot. It was artistic too. So, so there's some his green mustache. And my two-year-old's like not, not missing out on the action. He's like, well, she can do it. I'm going for the full goatee. <laughs> All right. Quick example. Just di- putting together discomfort and fun into a single experience changes the experience. Play a game. And this awful drink that literally tastes like grass shavings makes it a different experience. I looked down at their cups. They were both gone. I didn't have to ask them. I didn't have to beg them. I didn't say anything about it. We just played a game. It changed the way their brains related to the same behavior. Let me give you a couple more examples. Oh, sorry. Let me tell you why. I just, why this actually works. So there's a part of your brain, it's right above your eye. It's called your orbitofrontal cortex. Orbito, orbito, frontal cortex. Sorry, these words are awful. Um, but it's right there. You're looking at it. And there's this really cool thing the orb, your orbitofrontal cortex does. And it keeps track of how rewarding things are in memory. It holds it as like a memory bank, like a memory, it, it, like it, it prioritizes how rewarding some things are as compared to others. So if you think about this as a reward hierarchy, which is actually the technical term, what, what it looks like is an upside down stoplight. So all the things at the top of the ladder are, are much more desirable, much more rewarding, and all the things toward the middle are so-so, and all the things at the bottom are like, that's disgusting or that's not fun, or that was so boring, I made my mom poke my eyes out with ice picks. I mean, like, you know, like that's how your brain keeps track of whether or not it wants to do things again. So more rewarding, less rewarding, but most most importantly, what your brain's actually deciding is, is this thing worth repeating? Is this behavior or activity worth doing again? The higher on the ladder, the more your brain's like, ah, yes, more, please. Again, please. My kids, after playing the game with the green drink, are like, huh, yeah, I'd be willing to try that again. That's what their brain is saying. Before we played the game, they're like, this is the worst thing ever. Lawn shavings. Okay? And this is a flexible thing. It changes depending on our experiences and the way those add up in our memory. So again, another quick example. I don't like running, but I do it because it's good for me. Now, I didn't used to do it, but I started doing it. So if you just ask me, hey, James, what what do you think about running? This is where I'd put it on my reward hierarchy. It hurts. It's basically painful and um, often lonely, you know? I started getting creative and I'm like, you know, I, I think I can I, I, I could spice this up a little. I think I can make this more fun. So I'm like, who could I go running with? So I'm looking around. We got this neighbor. We moved into our neighborhood about, you know, just over a year ago. And I was like, we got this neighbor. And his name's Johnny. And I'm like, Johnny looks like he might run. I didn't know at the time. But I said, hey, Johnny, you ever go running? And he goes, yeah, I do, actually. I said, you want to go running together? He's like, sure. So not every day, but every every so often, Johnny and I go running together. So this is Johnny. And for some reason, having a friend do some really difficult activity with you makes it a little better. So for my brain, when I run with somebody else, nice conversation. You know, it's fun. It's fun to, you know, we're new to the area. So I'm investing in relationships and, and neighbors. Um, it's just a different, a re- more rewarding experience. Now, I told you a little bit about my wife. My wife's my favorite person in the world. Um, and this is Shaylin. Uh, in a 5K, a color me rad 5K. Have you ever heard of these things? <laughs> Where they they throw the, like, whatever it is, colored dust. Um, so So it's basically just a big party where people also run. 
you know, it's mostly a party. But 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 the point is, we did run 5K. I just remembered the party. Yeah. And I'm doing it with my favorite person in the world. So again, put that all together and like, wow. That's the best. Hanging out with all these people, great music, fun. You know, it's just fun. All right. Same activity. Just to be very clear. Everybody's running here. Same activity. Different things are added to that activity to make it more and more rewarding. This is this skill set I'm talking about with discomfort. It is not about grit necessarily. It is not about that sort of like, mm, what's the word? Um, it's not about toughness necessarily. It's really about skillful application of embracing discomfort. And this is one of the uh, one of the more uh, important pieces of this. All right. How do you make discomfort actually fun? How do you do this? Because it sounds like, wow, that's, that'd be nice. But like, is this really possible? All right. Number one, fun fusing. What is fun fusing? It's taking two things, right? Something uncomfortable, something you don't want to do. And something fun and actually linking them so that your brain starts believing these things go together. When I go running, I exercise with other people. I like other people. I just don't like the exercise. Okay, that's perfect. You're in the strike zone, right? I don't like folding the laundry, but I do like talking with my, you know, my dad. So maybe I'll call my dad while I fold the laundry. Okay, great. Over and over and over again, this 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 can happen. Um, a couple of, couple of examples. Exercise we we brought up already. Um, anybody anybody like a good series? You know, like a good uh, you know a good like drama or a good Netflix series. Boom. Every time, every time. If it's good, if it's well done thoughtful plot, you know, it's like, it's like really like holds your, you know, interest, curiosity. Um, suddenly push-ups take on a different life. It's like when you're trying to follow the, the plot and all the different characters and you're like, you're like, you know, doing push-ups, you, you do the push-ups, you notice the push-ups, but like, you're really invested in this, right? Or as if it's just push-ups, man, you feel every bit of pain. You feel every bit of pain. Changes the nature of the relationship. All right. Dishes, we've already mentioned. Or actually laundry, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm the dish guy in our house. Um, I, I really don't like dishes. I, I hate I hate the way, like the, 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 you know, like the soap stuff, like it makes my knuckles crack a little. You know, it's all that stuff that dishes do, right? Um, but I know if there are dishes in the sink, like it's on me. I'm the dish guy. So often we'll, you know, do the bedtime routine with the kids and it's, we're tired. We, sometimes we fall asleep up there and whatever. And then we'll like drag ourselves downstairs, my wife and I trying to do bedtime. And, and, and then I go, you know, it's 1030, maybe even 11. And, I'm, and I, we walk, you know, I walk past the kitchen. I'm just like, oh, gall. Did I seriously not get these done before we went upstairs? That feeling, right? And then I'm like, Hey, love, is there any possibility you can just come in the kitchen and just sit on the chair next to me so we can chat while I'm doing the dishes? And and my wife, she doesn't always take me up on it. It depends how late it is usually, but sometimes she does. And And she'll sit and we'll have a nice conversation. And suddenly, if we're having a conversation, Dishes feel like a breeze. Ever notice that? When you're doing housework with other people, it's like 10 times easier. Yeah. It's like when you do stuff together with other people, it adds an element of enjoyment and fun. And we're doing this together, even if they're not even doing it with you. If you're just having a conversation with them, it doesn't matter. So again, over and over and over again, the most monotonous life tasks, the difficult life tasks, the boring life tasks. Again, I hope you're hearing all your work tasks too, like email. Right. When we do these things together, it changes the task, changes the emotions that are connected to the task, and it helps us get through procrastination. All right. 
because we because we brought it up. Might as well unpack it. All right. It's not just again, not just emails in this in the sense that um, you know. All right. What I should say is people aren't the only thing we can fuse with. We can also change environments. So one of the biggest mistakes I see people do is just trying to push through difficult things without adding anything enjoyable. Right. So if I ever feel like I'm procrastinating something, I'm like, um, I just need to go work at the cafe. It's actually a food co-op, but, but, you know, think of a cafe, a nice, nice, pleasant place where there's nice seating, nice aromas, nice, you know, it's, it's a nice environment, good Wi-Fi, whatever. I, I, I literally, I, I, it's right there. I mean, I, I got, I got a ways to walk. Sometimes I drive it, you know, it's probably a 10 to 15 minute walk. Um, but, but just change the environment, change the environment. And I know it was like close to 90 degrees today. So in Florida, where you are, you can actually go outside. Uh, uh, but this is very Nobody, different. Nobody's walking in 90 degree weather in Florida. <laughs> that is not happening, James. That's what the car is for. <laughs> Two minute drive. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. What I meant was that right. beautiful 75 degree day. Um, um, but But being outside changes everything. Just a little bit of sun on our skin, boosts our mood, birds chirping, more pleasant environment. We woefully underestimate the power of changing our environment. We just try to push through. It usually looks like this, right? Just like a slog. And it's here. And if we just went outside, it would jump to here. So simple. So simple. All right. So we're going to do this exercise where I want you guys to take one minute to write down something you were procrastinating. And by the way, this is true for everyone. If you're procrastinating something, doesn't mean you're a bad person, just means you're a human. Everyone raise your hand if you're a human. Okay, good, good. Uh, okay, then we, are, we all have something we're procrastinating. Uh, and then one thing you want to pair it with, one fun thing you do want to pair it with. All right, so we're gonna just grab a pencil. You can also do it on your on your laptop or whatever. Uh, one minute to write down something you're procrastinating and one thing, fun thing you want to pair with. And then we're just gonna have a brief uh, discussion about it, and then we'll move on to the next topic. All right? Here you go. One minute. Feel free to turn off your camera if that helps. See you back in one minute. I just want to tell Minx, go to your dinner party. They're waiting for you. <laughs> go ahead, Minx. Yeah. One Enjoy. <laughs> All right. So if you feel so inclined, I would love for anyone to share what came up for them as far as what they procrastinate or what they tend to procrastinate. And one thing you can pair, one fun thing you can pair it with. But Bettina asked, or put in, I think here, daily walking as exercise. I fuse with listening to an audible book. Thriller. Nice. Good. Good. Perfect example. Perfect example. Others. Wow, Ali, that must be a lot of garbage <laughs> that you could get through a podcast while you're taking the garbage out. <laughs> Maybe it's one of those short ones. <laughs> I guess. Re 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 only reality, 10 minutes. <laughs> reality is I, 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 I'd rather listen 10 minutes or five minutes of a podcast and take this as an excuse to do the garbage then do the gar sure. dread the garbage with no fun associated to it 
That's so funny. I love to, I love doing the dishes. I love taking out the garbage. Like those are some of my favorite activities in the house. Okay. You are more than invited to come here to do it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll like, if you're cooking, then that'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, sounds fair. Uh, yeah, no, Ali, that, um, that, that's a great example of, of initiating that shift to just start the podcast. And then suddenly you're kind of in this mode and then, and then flipping into like the do a task combined with it. it. I thought you just said that quite brilliantly. Thank you for that. Um, Susan yeah, says, kind of like the um, trigger thing, like you were talking about last time. Yes. A little bit. Yes. Linking, linking two things together. Right. If I do this, then I also do this other thing. Exactly. Yep. Right. Getting, getting new clients paired with talking with colleagues from former employers Getting new clients paired with talking. Susan, is there any way you can elaborate on that? Yeah, I don't like asking people necessarily um, for work. So <laughs> if I, you know, say, oh, yeah, I haven't talked to you in a long time. And they'll say, oh, what are you doing? So then I, it's, you know, I'll talk about, oh, well, you know, I have a, have a couple of hours a week that, you know, I'm taking on new projects. Um, but the other work I'm doing is such and such. So it kind of gets them to think about me to uh to bring on some take on some work oh uh, yeah interesting it's like it's like uh it make yeah i totally get that that's it that's a really interesting application of it it's a very sophisticated application of it it is i appreciate that like susan it. oh yeah, thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you. minx are uh, you telling me you don't like country music and so you decide to cook to enjoy the country music no, we can't hear you. You, you got to hit your microphone again. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. Let me see if I can unmute you. I don't know if I can do it myself. Uh, let's see. Ask to unmute. That might work. <laughs> uh, uh, Minx? <laughs> you can't unmute? Oh. Oh, well. No, there it is. Okay, oh, got, got it. it. Sorry, I'm on a new iPad. I don't know where the buttons are. Oh, so yeah. I have I have a big learning curve here. No, I've, I've been doing that forever. I do lots of big dinner parties. And when I'm cooking, I turn on, I blast country Western music. So it makes it fun, it, the whole thing, even the chopping and the basic stuff. All right, I'm going to my dinner party. Good okay. night, everybody. Good Enjoy to see you. your party. Bye. Bye. See you soon, James. Good. See you soon. Yep. Um, that's okay, so funny. Great. That's another thing I love. I love the preparation and the cooking and all that stuff. I, I, I get lost in the mindfulness of doing the dishes, doing the cooking. Like to me, that's the fun part is paying attention to the smells and the sounds and the, the, the textures and the bubbles. I love the bubbles from the, uh, washing dishes. <laughs> You're getting into it now. Oh, I love it. All right. I, can't I am the weird one in the group. There's no doubt. Take care, Vince. Jimmy, I think everybody. I can't watch. figure out how to hang up. So I bet's I All right, really I'll kick you out then. You Can go, you, you go that? ahead and go to your party and I'll kick you out of the room. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Minx. Take care. All right. Well, so I fun fusing. Yeah. Fun fusing is principle number one. Ha bringing tooth a uh, uncomfortable hard thing combined with something that's enjoyable or fun that has positive emotions associated with it. Number two is fun framing. So this is a lot of what we do, of course, as coaches, um, but it really matters uh, when it comes to discomfort. Again, if you can think about, this is what the, the science is starting to show, is if you can, when, when, when discomfort, if you can come to expect discomfort as an indicator or seed in discomfort as an indicator that I'm on like a growth path, right? That there's some invitation there. There's something, there's an opportunity there. There's a stretch there. There's some I'm getting out of my comfort zone. And that's like, ooh, ooh, I'm leaning into that opportunity rather than that's an indication that I should get out of there, which is again, the default response. Mm -hmm. um, then, then our brain tends to uh, reframe the experience and, and we're much more likely not only to embrace it, but to persist through uh, the difficult emotions in order to have the positive outcomes we, we really want. 
Um, this matters a lot because feelings tend to follow the frame we give them. So thinking about this, this yes. is what Kevin Oxner's research and others have shown is that we, we, you know, an event happens, we give it an interpretation, and then the feeling follows from the interpretation. So it flows from the interpretation. So if I, um, you know, I've come to with the plunging, the polar plunging at least, come to anticipate a positive outcome. Now, again, in the middle, it gets a little rough because it's quite intense, but I've come to associate the positive feelings that I experience afterwards as part of the experience. So I look forward to it now. I actually like it. Now, I don't love it because it's still kind of hurt, difficult in the middle, but I've come to really like it, certainly like it enough that I, I don't, I actually do it on a daily basis now by choice, not because anybody's telling me I need to or should just, I just do it by choice. That's a really weird thing. That's a, especially something well, you that know it's good for hard, you, right? You know, it's good for you. You've done the research. You know that polar plunges are good. I take cold showers. They're really cold, but well, they're not cold in Florida because we don't have cold water down here, but um but I went to Georgia and those that's cold, like North Georgia and the mountains, that's cold, cold water. You have super cold water, but you know that cold showers are good for you. So that's that's an incentive to want to endure some pain, right? Yeah. So so just knowing it's good for me. Yeah. Massive difference. That's the frame, right? The interpretation right. of the experience that I put around it. This is healthy. This is good for me. This is good for my immune system. It's good for my energy levels. This is good for my you know, all those, all those, all those good things. All right. This is my little guy that you saw earlier. Um, this is him for Halloween. Well, during the Halloween season, this last, last year, um, he fell in love with during Halloween, this little pumpkin. All right. So he would take his pumpkin everywhere he went. He would sleep with the pumpkin. Everything was about this pumpkin this last Halloween. He loved this little pumpkin. It was about this big. And one morning, he was you're literally right there on in that high chair and and he the pumpkin was also on the high chair so i was making eggs doing the thing breakfast thing and all of a sudden i hear this thud my back's to him so i can't see what fell but i sort of know what already happened before i turn around sure enough turn around and the pumpkin is underneath his high chair split into um i i he can't see it because it's actually under at this point <laughs> I'm like, he's going to be devastated. I'm like, so I, I don't even know how this occurred to me, but I'm running over to try to like anticipate the whale that I'm ex expecting. Right. I grab the pumpkin and I hold it up to him and I say, buddy, oh, no way. We got one of the special pumpkins, the kind that open up on the week of Halloween. And, and his eyes like lit up this big, like what? not a whiff of negative emotion. Here was his prized possession split into, I reframed it as the best thing ever. And he was like, whoa, aren't we lucky? All right. So, so again, feeling follows frame. Feeling follows frame. Again, this happens over and over and over again. This is the split pumpkin about a week after it split, it kind of started getting curled on the edges, but, but, uh, over and over again, he thought it was the coolest thing ever. All right. Let's talk about a few frames that really work with when it comes to discomfort. One is the game frame. Game frame is arguably probably one of the better ones. Um, this is the one I use a lot. One of the games I actually play with discomfort is something called the DQ game. Cue, cue some like do, 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 whatever you want, but like we're going to play the DQ game, right? Monitoring or tracking your discomfort quotient. Here's how this works I actually track how many times I embrace discomfort over and I divide it by how many times I experience discomfort. And that gives me this nice little DQ, daily DQ score. All right. Mm -hmm. Somehow, and I track it on a little app called Tally. So if I had, you know, four times in the day that I embraced discomfort out of seven possible times I could have embraced discomfort, this gives me my daily DQ score of four out of seven. And it gives me a nice little percentage. Right? Now, 
I'm not going for perfection. <laughs> I'm just interested in the game. Over time, yeah, it's nice to see a little bit of progress, right? More time, embrace on average, discomfort more often than not. But but when it feels like a game, again, I've already used the example of my wife giving me feedback. My wife's the best person in the world. I love her to death. And so generally speaking, in my brain's reward hierarchy, she's here. But when she's giving me feedback, it like changes. You know, it's like it's like suddenly it's not so rewarding to be hanging out together because she's like giving me feedback, you know. But when I play this DQ game and I'm like, wait, 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 all that difficult emotion that comes up when we give or receive feedback, I'm like, oh, wait, this is the very thing I'm working on. I'm like, and I lean in closer and I listen more carefully and I'm not so defensive. And I say, huh, that's really interesting. And it changes how my brain relates to her, even in a difficult conversation. So again, Think about the last time you got feedback and think about the psychological state you were in when receiving it. Now, I want you to think, how can you turn it into a game? Now, turning it into a DQ, the DQ, tracking your DQ is a viable option. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a very viable option. Something that's fun, it's trackable, it's, it's actually like quantifiable and it feels like something that you can actually see or, or, or track to make, you know, see progress on over time. Um, I just want you, we're not gonna do the exercise for, for sake of time, but I want you to just think about next time I get feedback, how do I turn this into something that's just a little bit more enjoyable? Maybe it's turning it from a threat response to a challenge response. Maybe it's thinking of the gold bricks here. Maybe it's thinking of the feedback as gold bricks that are being thrown at your head. Yeah, they hurt like crazy when they hit. But if you just look down and pick them up, they're really valuable. Right? It's like a game. It's like how many, how, like, can you take the golden bricks? They're, they're incredibly valuable. They just hurt a little bit. So you just got to square those shoulders. And and it's a game, right? It's it's different than just seeing it as, oh no, here we go again. All right, last thing. Fun filling. And again, this is not something that happens simultaneous. This is something that happens outside of the discomfort. So I think of this as daily deposits of fun. All right. Fun is an investment. Self-care, all that stuff is an investment in our wellness. And it's what gives us the resilience to actually do the hard things in our lives without these deposits, you know, and again, I'm thinking weekends, I'm thinking vacations, I'm thinking mostly time spent with people you love, you know, um, but I'm also thinking stuff that's solitary, you know, hiking, um, doing things, you know, hobbies, other things that fill you, that fill up your tank, um, that you actually just enjoy. Fun is not frivolous. Fun is an investment. And it actually we, we know this from the research, Barbara Fredrickson, Rick Hansen, and others have shown that if you do this intentionally, you'll have more in the tank, more a reserve that you draw on in times of stress that you don't feel overwhelmed. It makes the stressful times more sustainable, right? So this is the one of the antidotes to burnout, among other things. All right. I'm just going to move through that. So again, there's lots of different ways we can do this. This is just a short list, but I want you to just kind of brainstorm in your mind. How can I fill my tank intentionally? Not like, oh, this is like, you know, indulgent, or this is some aberration, or I can't really share this because it's like a guilty pleasure. No, 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 no. This is like part of the strategy for doing growth-filled activities and hard things, you know, uh, during the week. Um, or, or during the weekend, doesn't matter when you do them. But the point is, um, you really do need this restorative portion uh, in order to do those difficult things. Otherwise, um, you just simply won't have enough uh, in the tank and you will over time, as I've done twice in my life, you'll burn out. All right. I have one quick question about Please. those things, James. Um, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but a lot of those things you know, like making fun, uh, trying to find ways to fill the bank. Um, it, it's, 
it's really a matter of being aware, not just doing those things, but taking account of them and being more aware of what you're doing. Because we can all do those things, but if we don't take time to account for it in some way, and I know the little orbitofrontal cortex is trying to help me and keep a tally, but I do get the sense that I have to account for it in my own way and be aware of it in some way to be able to remember. Like, I'm not going to remember, oh, I played catch with my son three weeks from now, unless I make a conscious effort to know what's going on. Is is there, uh, am, am I kind of on the right track or? You are on the right track. Or does it happen anyway? And I don't have to be so aware. It's a little of both, I, we think. So, so you can amplify, it's really like amplifying the effect. Um, so right. When, when okay. You, when it's, when you, when you reflect on it, when you journal about it, when you have a gratitude practice that re reminisces about it, savors those, you know, moments of, it, it amplifies the emotion, deepens and tends to solidify the, the yeah. building power of those positive emotions. Whereas when you just have those experiences, but don't do those practices, you're right. It does tend to um, evaporate, the, the positive effect yeah. of them evaporates. Yeah, that makes sense. Quickly. Yeah. And that's why a, a, a weekly gratitude journal is so helpful, right? You don't have to do it every day, but doing it once a week, maybe twice a week is probably helpful because you can come up with some good things to remember. Um, I don't know. I'm just throwing these things in here as things that, that I find helpful. Yes. Yes. So, 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 so one way to sort of mix that up, if you want to do like gratitude is to do gratitude wins and DQs. Like sometimes you can kind of mix up the, what you're reflecting on, where you, what you're counting as those wins or things to reflect on. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of also creates a little more variety. So we don't, you know, over, kind of overdo the, the gratitude. All right. I want to make sure we get to, yeah, to, to overdoing the gratitude, but some is good. <laughs> It is good. Yeah. There's a dosing thing, but, but mo oh, most right. of us don't do it enough. Yes. True. Um, um, just, just to, to, to end here, right. Mastery always feels better than comfort. So, so mastery in the end becomes its own kind of reward. Growth becomes its own kind of reward, even though it's hard, it's also much more rewarding than staying comfortable. That's the irony. Uh, so next time you find yourself at the literal or metaphorical edge of the ice. Um, just remember your brain's gonna be predicting you wanna avoid this. This is not gonna be good. The discomfort or awkwardness or fear that you're experiencing uh, makes you wanna run away. But just realize your brain is not telling you necessarily the whole story, which is again, after you do the hard thing, you're gonna have very different emotions. <laughs> and those emotions tend to be confidence, excitement, energy, um, and, and even joy. All right. With that, just want to go into questions. We have a handful of minutes. Um, and, uh, and then I just want to leave you with a, a quick note about, um, a little discount code I have for my course before we end. What questions there, came up? There, there was a question way back. Ali had asked, um, and, and I can't remember where it was, but he asked, how does this all relate to anti-fragility concept? And I'm not familiar with what that means exactly. So maybe Ali, you could um, elaborate on that. Are you talking about Nassim Nicholas yes. Taleb's book, yes. Anti-Fragile? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, it's very much uh, in the same uh, thesis. He's he's dealing with with macro phenomena, you know, uh, resilient systems and and things like that. Um, so, so the level of analysis is, is different, you know, he's looking at, at things much more, uh, you know, like a, like a economist or a sociologist or, or on that level, political scientist, maybe. Um, but you're right, absolutely right. Uh, working on discomfort tolerance is a way to become more anti-fragile. That's, that's one way to say this. Um, I, Framing in words matter. I, I would, I would. Another way of saying that is just resilient. Um, and I think, I think what we're what we're really describing here is resilient nervous systems. Yeah. To distinguish it, maybe a little bit from from him. Yeah, please, okay. Bettina. Perfect. Thank you. You bet, Bettina. Uh huh. Thank you, James. Very interesting topic and fun too. Um, I had a question. Um. 
The imposter syndrome. Mm. Would you say that it happens when you see the circles of comfort zone? Then I have it, the next one fear, the next one learn, then growth, and the last one panic. Do you consider that this would appear in the panic zone or earlier when growing mm -hmm. towards something that you're not used to? That's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I might have to think about that, Bettina. Oh, Reflect good. on that for a little while. Yeah, um, I, was, I was thinking about which one, but I'm interested in knowing mm -hmm. your answer on this. Yeah, I, I actually think it could probably be either, um, you know, either the growth or the panic. And part of that's a question of, uh, scientists refer to this as arousal, like how strong the response is in the body. Um, meaning the stronger it gets, the more likely one is to tip into kind of that panic state. Um, but um, so much of, I think, imposter syndrome, um, hmm, how do I say this? Well, I, I think the, there's different ways to look at it, of course, right? One is one is there's a, there's some there's reframing work to be done. I.e., you are an incredibly competent human. I there's no from the outside and there's no objective reason to feel imposter syndrome. That's there's sort of like that and that way of thinking about it. So how do we work with the intrapsychic dimension here to try to reframe your relationship to your competencies? right? The, the sort of relationship to the self and your knowingness of your own capacities, which are oftentimes much more than the person believes they are. Mm -hmm. um, there's that social dimension, which is maybe there's social feedback that people are getting that they don't have what it takes. And maybe there's, you know, um, prejudices or stereotypes or things going on there that that are that are filtering those uh comments or feedback um but i i think on an individual level the goal what what i've dis, what it seems true to me and what the science seemed to suggest is that when we're focused on the experience of doing difficult things on a daily basis that we choose or opt into that have some meaning to us. Typically it has to matter at least somehow uh, to us. Um, that there is a, there is a, I think of almost like a seed that's planted that starts to grow that then and, and the seed is like evidence, right? There's like the, all this evidence of the competence or, or the, um, it's really self-efficacy we're talking about. So it's this confidence that grows in a person um, when they perceive that they're succeeding at something. And so I think the, depends on the situation, right? With, with imposter syndrome, but I think the one of the exciting things about this area of research is that there is a there's a there's a there's an opportunity to start uh, planting that seed of confidence in the person through these micro wins that over time create this whole momentum that then naturally lifts that feeling of imposter syndrome and it just kind of goes away on its own. Um, obviously, I'm simplifying a little bit uh, so that because there's obviously a complexity to to each situation, but that's the gist as I as I see it. Thank you, James. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, I'm going to just make sure that um, I share this with you because I, 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 I think I shared this last time I, I presented. But um, there's a there's a course. This is not this is separate from the course, but the course itself that I that I offer. Um, the next one will be on March 23rd. Has these four different modules. It's it's 30 credit hours from from ICF, so it's it's CCE credited. Um, but it's these. It's really like a crash course in the brain and behavioral science of coaching. So habits, how we form habits, how we how we you know 
become more productive and deal with distraction and these kinds of things, overcoming fear and anxiety. Some of that we talked about today um, and, and uh, happiness. So, so really the science of positive psychology. So that's, that's coming up if anybody's interested. Um, and this is the, there's a little coupon code there and I'll put the, the link in the chat. There's, there's a $200 off coupon code if anybody's interested. So feel free to please do e email me. Um, I'll put my email address in the, in the chat. If anybody's interested in that, feel free to shoot me a line and we'll, we'll connect about that. But thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you for, for all the wonderful questions. I wish we had more time actually. I, I know. Well, maybe one day we'll do a two hour, but I don't know. Then, then we've got to work out a whole new thing. <laughs> 90 minutes Thanks. is going to be good. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, teaching us more about how to get fun, comfortable, how to link and fuse and refresh frame and all that kind of stuff, linking the things we do on a regular basis that we don't really like to do and mixing them with a bit of fun so that we can enjoy them and teach our brain that this is something we should want to do because there's it's there's fun in this and there's reward. So thank you so much for all of that.